welcome uh, everybody back here on Siegel Talk at the Martin E. Siegel Theaters and the Graduate Center CUNY in Manhattan in New York City at City University. And it's another day on uh, planet Earth, another week uh, for us. I think it's week 17 where we talk to theater artists in New York City, in the uh, US, but also globally all around the world for it's over a hundred artists have shared with us how they experienced that very unique and uh, uh, somehow still unbelievable moment we are going through this catastrophe movie we all live inside where um, the outside world uh, seems stranger than any fiction and when we go outside we also do feel like uh, we are not longer no longer the reality we used to know and the question is what will be what will happen uh, will ever go back uh, what has changed and uh, what will change and uh, what we do know, life will be very, very different. Somehow we are uh, so far away from each other and somehow also closer through Zoom and talks like this. And it has a profound impact, of course, on the theater community. Theaters are closed and mostly around the globe, even so there are first openings in France, Germany, and other countries. Portugal, as we heard from Thiago Rodriguez in a wonderful interview in the last week. Um, but it's bleak, people are out of jobs, musicians, technicians, uh, lighting designers, actors, and uh, we do not really know where all this will go. Over 45 million Americans filed for unemployment uh, at a certain time, and uh, uh, violence in cities is up, uh, uh, but also uh, civil unrest, which is a good thing that people voice their protest on um, the streets and the Black Lives Matter a movement had a profound impact that we all do think and we all do know and uh, and so it's a just um, an incredible moment in history we are going uh, through America has higher and higher numbers still the highest in the world up to 70 80 thousand infections a day New York City is doing well down from 800 dead people in a day in April I think it was April 17 for five or six days it was without one COVID uh, loss uh, of life which is remarkable yeah. and it is a great city we all live in and it will come back. The question just is how. Um, New York is such a unique place and such a great place. And one of the reasons is the variety and diversity of uh, the cultural offerings of theater performance. And a part of that community, even so a little bit overlooked, very unfairly, I think, is the tap dance uh, community. It's a fantastic art form, I think, like jazz. It's an American invention. It's an art form that uh, collected influences from around the globe, but yet yet it's a uniquely American um, uh, uh, art form that went through many changes, ups and downs, and now I think uh, it is also uh, enjoying a moment of resurgence, but also internationally, uh, perhaps even uh, more people are doing tap dance outside the US and inside, and it has become a serious art form. And uh, with us today, we have three significant uh, members um, of that community. So I'm gonna uh, read a little bit from the bios, not too much, you can see it out there, but uh, with us is uh, Asia Gray. Asia, thank you for joining us. And mm -hmm. she's a soloist, choreographer, and master teacher who has toured in the US and run since 1983 and co-founded the Tapestry Dance Company in Austin, Texas. She uh, was the artistic director of the Soul to Soul a tap dance festival is not so easy for Germans uh, to pronounce this. And she's a graduate of the American Academy of Traumatic Arts in New York City, just close by uh, to the graduate um, center. She re received many, many uh, uh, awards uh, for her uh, great work. The Hoover Award, the American Tap Dance Foundation gave that out to her. And she was nominated for the Princess Grace Award in the early 90s. And she served as the director of the International Tap Association. and. Um, her work toured in the US, Canada, China. She's seen on documentaries, a class act, uh, a magic uh, of only cold, tap or die, thinking on their feet, and uh, so many, many more things on PBS. And uh, she is uh, truly uh, a core member of uh, what American uh, tap dance is about. Uh, Deborah is also with us, Deborah Mitchell, and she uh, now is for over 25 years the uh, founder and artistic director of New Jersey's tap dance ensemble and she has a rich and extensive background in Korea with the art form of tap and uh, she was a protege of Leslie Buba Gaines and uh, 
the kinesthetics, if I say that right, and the really award-winning uh, uh, professionals. And the credits includes the Cotton Club, a great movie picture, a Broadway production, Black and Blue, PBS, great performances, and tours with the great Pat Calloway, and uh, many, many uh, other things. Uh, under her direction, NJ Tap Dance Ensemble has received uh, People's Choice Awards, which is a big thing, an important thing, that people like what you do, I think. Yes. And uh, it has to be uh, uh, a citation of excellence in the arts uh, from, from the stage she works in. So that are really congratulations uh, on you. your uh, art. And with us also is Tony Bach, who's the founder of the American Tap Dance Foundation. It's a nonprofit in New York City uh, since 2001, with the mission to establishing and legitimizing tap dance as a vital presentation, education, and art form. And so he created the tap Festival in New York City, the International Tap Dance Hall of Fame, Tap Preservation, Hoofer Awards, uh, Gregory Hines, Youth Scholarship Fund, and so, so, so much more. And he has been featured in hundreds of concerts, film, and television uh, productions. And um, he is uh, uh, opening at the moment, uh, in, since 2010, the New York City American Tap Dance Center, where he educates and mentors and uh, and trains uh, uh, next generation um, of tap dancers. Uh, Tony and I met uh, when we presented Brian Seibert's great, great book. Uh, it's Brian Seibert, who's now the, one of the dance critics at the New York Times, uh, who has a great uh, love and uh, dedication and devotion to tap dance. Our book he wrote, I think 10, 12 years on, was called What the Eyes Hear, The History of Tap Dancing. And for three days, we screened from his private archive material. We collected it for the first time and I did a couple of evening events um, with it. So um, I apologize for talking so long. And uh, uh, it is all about listening. And today we would like to listen from you to hear how is the uh, tap dance uh, community uh, doing? And Asia, maybe we'll start with you. Where are you at the moment and how are you? I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening. That's the biggest thing I'm doing right now. Um, I am in a position also as an administrator and artistic director of Tapestry Dance Company, just really looking into surviving the next season. It's hard to go past that. It's actually in Austin, Texas, being one of the, the hot spots of COVID-19 right now in the South. Uh, things change here weekly, daily. And... Um, writing grants, figuring out uh, what to do with my professional dancers that come from around the world. One of them made it into Australia back home. Will he be able to come back? Um, pretty much Austin, um, the public through a, a major survey said they will not go uh, and see performances inside a building. And Tapestry has actually been closed since March 14th because we will not teach inside a building during this crisis, uh, which is very hard. There are dance studios, commercial studios that are doing such, but um, safety is number one priority for us. And I think, um, and many people, um, personally, um, I know that our future is going to include uh, online offerings, uh, which is such a wonderful asset that's been added to our plate. However, at this time, as an artistic director, I'm not a filmmaker. So when I think about uh, producing online, um, do I have a budget to bring somebody in that actually can help create a situation that is, that is going to uh, touch people's lives online? Uh, the big mission of Tapestry is weaving dance into life. And uh, the professional company does concept performances that really do have messages of healing and making a difference in the world. And of course, many times we will also showcase our beautiful American art form of tap dance and, and pay homage to our great mentors and masters uh, and share the oral history through our education programs, etc. But um, it really is about survival right now and um, finding a way to pull together the professional dancers, whether we're spread around the world. One of my dancers is waiting. He had a flight to Brazil that keeps getting canceled because Brazil is as bad as the States are right now. Yeah, um, it's number then, two, yeah. 
Yeah, and just not knowing where he's going to be, waiting for a dancer to come in either as a, a, a replacement or as an apprentice for Mexico. Well, Mexico is not the is is not uh you know they're they're in hard shape so it really is juggling this and um i don't want to lose the connection to the passion to the love of what we do um i'm sorry i'll probably <laughs> i've been a drummer and musician since i was seven years old and uh, i was raised in a musical family um, found out later that my biological father was the, a drummer and leader of a swing band, but my stepfather was actually a musician. So fate has it that I am a musician. And tap dance found um, its way into my life late in my career after I was at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. And uh, I came back to Austin for a vacation. And one thing led to another and I auditioned for a tap company back in the late 80s, which I thought, what's a tap company? And you know, I had enough tap, you know, here's, the, here's the, the thing that many of us that are raised in theater, you have enough tap of those basic, those basic skills of the white Broadway scene of tap that I could get into a musical if I auditioned for a musical. Um, and I worked as a, a tap dancer in a touring company called Austin on Tap for many years, a busy, a busy company. But I was chosen uh, for a conservatory to work with Honey Coles in 1989. And when I met that man, and I met many of those great mentors and their protégés and students around them, it completely changed my life. And that's when Tapestry was born. Actually, Tapestry was born in Boulder, Colorado, in a booth on Pearl Street with Deirdre Strand, who's the co-founder, and Diane Walker on the other side, brainstorming what's going on. And just losing that that face to face in the room being a musician connection is what i'm so missing right now um and i don't want to lose the opportunity to educate and to share history and learn more history i considered myself a very educated progressive non-racist which is not a term i use anymore person until many things have come back to me in the last few weeks that um, I have apologized for in my, um, you know, unconscious systemic racism that this country is based in. And I want to be, and I want Tapestry to be a part of big change that needs to happen. And it is really, that is really affecting our tap community right now. And um, the love for each other and the love of rhythm and the love of our history, um, oral history, the stories, the, the black artists involved, the homage to our black mentors and masters, all the people that help weave all of this stuff together. It's a, it's, it's a fabric. It's a, it's, 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 I want, our community has never been perfect. No community is ever perfect. Um, but I want the communication to stay open. I want healing to happen. I want people to listen to each other. And I want tap dance not to just be, you know, you had mentioned that it's a big resurgence of tap dance. Well, yes, it has been an amazing resurgence of tap dance through what's gone on in the last 30 years. But it's still on, it's not on the main stage in everybody's world around, you know, in America. If somebody says, you know, that I'm a tap dancer, a lot of people will answer that by saying, oh, I used to do that when I was a kid. And they don't even realize how insulting that is. Thank you. you know, it, it's just, oh my God. And, you know, I remember early, early in my career when, when Tapestry was first born, I had a, a born, I had a solo and it was, a, it was called Biorhythms and I'm talking to myself. And I remember just the passion. And one of the things I said, it's like, you're a tap dancer pause and you're white so that has also been a part of my life and it but it's my passion and i don't want conflict to keep the passion of a community of rhythm in america of the roots you know i was a kid in mississippi i remember the signs the white the white drinking fountains etc i've been around that crap and to see that stuff returning now and not obviously the, the white drinking fountains, but what I hold hope for 
And what's so wonderful to see is the diverse protests. There are so many of us that want change, not only in the world, but especially here, everywhere and in America, and change in how people see tap dance. You know, people need to know where it comes from. They need to know the history. We need to get it out of the, you know, we play so many of our platforms of tap dancer in and around tap dance festivals that are attended by tap dancers and their parents and friends. You know, there are shows that don't, but they're not the majority. And it's education. It's educating these people about what this form is and what it's lived through, what it's struggled through, what it means and share that oral history that's not written down. It's still, fight. it's like Deborah. It's like Deborah talking to people about what did Bubba say to her in yeah. that room and what was yeah. happening. That's good. So that's Deborah, the stuff we need to hear. Exactly. Yeah, thank you, thank you, As Asia. Um, and Deborah, mm -hmm. so we, where are you at the moment? And tell us a bit how you feel and what's going well, on. Well, <laughs> A lot of what AC just said, you know, was resonating. I went, yes, 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 yes. Especially when I think about um, where tap, what's happening right now in our world. Um, when I think back, I was privileged enough to have a mentor, who, uh, Leslie Bubba Gaines. Um, and I know why she became emotional. Um, I love the art form so much that I was seeking it out. Uh, now, I, I came from, now my hometown is St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah. And um, as a black child growing up, my parents, my mother in particular, uh, al always knew how much I loved to dance. In fact, she was responsible for putting me into a dance school so I could tap dance because she said I was moving in her womb. So she knew that was the right thing to do for me. However, believe it or not, she took me out of that school because of racism. Mm. They kept little black girls like me in the back. Mm. And my mother could see from the time I was very young how talented I was. And she said, you're not going back. And we fought, I was no more than eight, but we fought about it. And she said, no, you're not gonna be in the back. This is before black was beautiful as far as society is concerned. Yeah. So um, she took my tap shoes away from me and put them in a closet, but I would go in the closet when she wasn't looking <laughs> and put the shoes on <laughs> with me. She yeah. kept hearing this noise, but of course it was me in the closet. So she said to me what I'm sure a lot of young black children hear. And she said, you're going to get an education. You can dance anytime. And this, see, this goes back to other kinds of, of thinking about black and people and dance. She said, you will always be able to dance. That is, she says, that's in your blood, but you're going to get an education so that you can take care of yourself. I mentioned this because it's like full, uh, it's full, a full cycle for me when I look at what's happening today, because now fast going back a little bit, uh, it's so many pieces of this. So finally I did go to school. Okay. And, and I did what she wanted me to do because I knew that she was right. It would be necessary. If she wanted to be sure that I was an independent young black woman, not having to get married or have to live with other people. She wanted to be sure that was there. However, once I finished my education and I, I was fortunate enough to even get a master's degree in uh, social work, which I have used many times in this field, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, because set to, because dancers need, they have many, many needs when it comes to understanding them. I love it. I know. You're a walker. You know, they need to talk, you know, and it was in group work, which is even better because I'm around groups so much. But um, I went ahead and I did what she asked. But I knew that I wanted to dance. And I didn't dance in college. I, I had to first get that done. But I wanted to dance. So I knew that coming east would be the place for me if, if I wanted to pursue that kind of career. Make a long story short, I was never a dancer. I was not a tap dancer who was bred, obviously, in a dance school, because I was taken out of that when I was eight, nine years old. 
So it was still something, though, deep in my psyche that I wanted to do. And um, I found in New York, and some people don't even, probably don't remember, there was a Clark Center. Clark Center was where all the dancers, and this is long before Broadway um, uh, danced and any of those. And um, I was supposed to go to um, a New Year's, I had a, a date, New Year's Eve. And the gentleman who was going to take me on this date said he would meet me he would come and get me out of the, he pick me up from the studio well when he got to the studio i wasn't ready to go so he said you know what i don't think you really want to do this but i think where you need to go is to the brooklyn academy of music where they're going to be some old hoofers there that wow. you need to see and i thought oh my god well he wasn't insulted he said i just think you need to go and see them and he was right so I got in my little car and I didn't know where the hell Brooklyn was, but I, I, <laughs> I, and there were no GPSs, no cell phones, none of that. I just asked people on the street, direct me towards Brooklyn. So I got in my car, I get over to the academy. And of course, um, I think it was late, level, I guess it was late in the evening because I thought to myself, I didn't want to see a performance. I wanted to see tap dancing in its rawness i you know when we're getting ready for shows where we know we're dressed and people said i wanted to see tap dancing the, the young man told me these guys were the founders he said these are the men you need to see and i thought oh, well i don't need to see them in a show i can't afford a show anyway but if i could see them in a rehearsal what that would mean to me oh because that's what you know when we're rehearsing that's when you see us at our truly to me at our best. I and mean, we're working it out, we're fixing it and getting it together. So I decided, okay, it's tomorrow. So I decided I would just sit there in my car until the next morning when I could get into this. I didn't know how I was gonna get in, but believe it or not, I, I slept in my car till the early morning light, as they say. <laughs> and then the maintenance men, they called them garbage men then, of course, we've gotten very, very special. You know, they, they were coming to take out the garbage from Brooklyn Academy of Music, and they left open a back door. Wow. When they left that door open, I sneaked in to the academy, and in the darkness, I found my way through to the auditorium. When I got to the auditorium, I sat down. Oh. With, oh. with my tap shoes in my purse oh. and I waited and I did I fell asleep and I was awakened by voices and of course you know it was like when a child is doing something that they're not supposed to you know you get scared when you hear things so when I heard these voices it startled me and I jumped up so when I jumped up, the tap shoes fell out of my lap and hit the floor. And a tall, distinguished gentleman came to the edge of the stage and said, who the hell is out there? I said, oh. so, and I jumped, I said, oh, just me. And he said, who is just me? So I got in the light because there was no light out there in the auditorium, it was all on the stage. And I, when I got further up, he says, little girl, what are you doing here? Get up here. So I picked up my tap shoes, put them in my purse, and I went up on the stage. And I told him, I said, I'm here because a friend of mine told me some old guys <laughs> were going to be here getting ready for a concert, and I wanted to see them. He said, well, you're looking at the old guys. Oh. He said, so old guys, introduce yourselves to the little lady. I was in the presence of tap dance royalty, I call it today. <laughs> this, this, it'll blow your mind. The tall gentleman was Honey Cole. Yeah. He's, the other gentleman came forth. He said, I'm Charles Cook. <sighs> Cookie. Buster Brown oh. was there. Face Roberts, uh, I'm, they're, uh, Faye Yard Nicholas of the Nicholas Brothers. Um, mm -hmm. Then he said, uh, uh, oh, let me see, great. And then there was a gentleman by the name of Bubba Gaines. And all he said was Leslie Gaines. But Bubba was always rather quiet. He was mm -hmm. not a real aggressive dancer in the sense of, of, of speaking a lot. So. 
he, I said, I'm sorry, sir. I said, but I didn't get your name. He said, Leslie Bubba Gaines, but you can, all my friends call me Bubba. He said, so just say Bubba. He said, but why are you here? He said, aren't you, why should, you should be in a dance school or someplace taking class. Well, I said, because I don't see or hear anything in the school that, that I like. So he said, well, what is it that you like? I said, well, it's not so much that I don't like it. I don't hear it. He said, well, what do you hear? So I looked at him. He said, can you sing it? Uh. And I said, well, so he said, well, I'll tell you what. So he started to move his feet and tears came to my eyes. I said, that's what I hear. He said, okay, that's that rhythm that you're hearing inside of yourself. So I said, but that's it. He said, well, look, he said, I, I, t I tell you what, he said, and he told me later that he had two thoughts in his mind. He said, either this child is crazy or she's a genius, but to come in here with tap shoes among this group of men who have been dancing all their life. So he said he couldn't believe that I would go through such turmoil just to get there. So he said, I'm going, where do you live? I said, I'm in Newark. He said, I'll come over to Newark and check out your feet. I, he said, in the meantime, you have carte blanche to come to the concert tomorrow, which was great feats of feet. Uh. And, right, and that's when I met Dizzy Gillespie and all these people. But getting back to Bubba, this was what touched me my, so deeply. I had been working out in Newark in an abandoned, uh, abandoned community center. It was in the South Ward of Newark, which is considered one of the most dangerous wards you could possibly be in where the riots had occurred and all these things were going on. But I loved this place because they had a wood floor in the building. Only caveat was that you had to climb a fence to get into this building through the back. So, so when Bubba came over on the train with his dance bag, I said, uh, I'm, I, I, I was embarrassed. I said, you know where I, where I practice? Um, it's an old abandoned building. He said, so? I don't care. I've been around the world. You said, let's go see it. So we get there, and I was worried because I knew he was up in age, and I was worried about him getting over this fence. It was a tall wire <laughs> fence that he had to scale to go in the back door of this building. You know, this sounds crazy. This is what my life has been like. So when we, would you believe when we got to the fence, he said, oh, Okay, he threw his dance bag over the fence and he climbed it faster than I did. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we get on the inside and I hate to take up all your time on this, but you got, oh. th th this will tell you where my roots really come from. Talk about, I know AC, what she's talking about, talk about passion and loving something. Oh. We got inside of the building and he went up on the stage with me, no lights, just windows, no, you know, nothing like a dance studio. I'm just in an old abandoned building and I, that floor was so magnificent. You could hear every tap. So he says, okay, get up there and go ahead and dance. Well, I got on that stage. I did every, I think I did every, every exercise I knew, little time step, little flaps. I was working myself to death and he's not looking at me. He's walking around not looking at me at all. And finally he stops and he says to me, your right foot, no, your left foot is stronger than your right. And he said, you thought I wasn't paying any attention to you. He said, I was just listening to you. He said, I think you got something there, little girl. He said, but I'm gonna give you something else. So he said, so he reached down in his bag and he pulled out a jump rope. Uh, and he said, you know what this is? I said, it's a jump rope. He said, can you do a time step? I said, yeah. He said, can you do a time step and jump rope at the same time? I said, sure. So he said, okay. So he gives it to me. He walked away from me while I was doing the jump rope and time step. And he came back. His Bubba's eyes were kind of a bluish gray. He came back and there were tears in his eyes. He said, I grew up in in Georgia I had two partners we went all over the world and one of them was called Hutch who did this jump rope he said but Hutch had a problem and when we were in Europe getting ready to go on 
we found out that he had overdosed in the dressing room. He said, but that little, he used to tell me that one day I would see him again. He said, and I used to laugh about it. He said, when I saw you jumping, I saw him again. He said, this is going to take you around the world. He said, and I'm going to give it to you. And from that day on, not only was it important to me to remember what this man had done, was doing for me, he took me into New York, in New York City. We were in the studio three and four days of the week. And I mean, hours. And then he'd take me up to Harlem and go to all the bars and he'd sit me on a stool and he'd tell me stories about his life and about the people he had been with all of his life. He poured all of this into me. One afternoon I told him, I said, we just can't keep doing this and I not pay you something. Because I knew there was a history of these men not getting their just due. Yeah. And I said, I will not do that to you. I have to pay you something. He looked at me, he said, I don't want your money, but someday someone's gonna look at you the way you looked at me about this art form. And when you give them back everything that I've given to you, you will have paid me in full. That was the, that statement to me was really the genesis of why I founded New Jersey Tap Ensemble. I wanted to give away all this man had given to me. And it was so much. It wasn't just steps. He gave me his life. He, it was his blood. He, would, he made sure he would talk to me. He, was, he said one day, I'm not worried about your dancing because that's in your soul. But it's a business that can be a bitch. And I want you to know that you're gonna to have to be strong to survive it. And I learned all the things about he, his, his group was, was blackballed in Europe for 10 years because they couldn't read the fine print in a contract. And he told me, he said, you're an educated young woman. That's gonna take you far. He said, so you keep, don't throw that away. You keep those things together. So when people say to me, you know, what did, the, what did he teach you? They're thinking about steps, but he taught me about life and survival. And all, he even mentioned to me, Bubba was very fair. He was like Lena Horne and some of, the, uh, some of our ancestors who were very fair. You wouldn't know that they were black people just by looking at them. And when he was younger, he was extremely fair. And he said, we haven't had, we had a gig one time and his two partners were brown like I am. And he said, they wanted to hire us until they saw the two partners were brown. And he said, that's when in Manhattan, they said, no, we can't, uh, we'll take you, Bubba, but we won't take your two partners. He said, and it was because they were brown. He said, I know it. He said, and I said, you either take all three or you take none. He had conviction. He had all these, so he, he taught me things that today in our tap community and places when people start to talk about, you know, when I see people tap dancing, I, I many times want them, I stop them. I want them to know this is something that goes deep. It, it's, you, people say to me, I tell my, my students, when you watch an artist doing this art form, what draws you to one and doesn't draw you to another? I said, it's that deep passion. It's that thing inside. It's that internal metronome. It's something that you can't, I can't give you. I can never teach it. I knew that from Bubba because many times I would, he was, he would say to me, you got an internal metronome. You're not going to get lost. I'm not worried about that. All these things he embodied into me. And when I started the company 26 years ago, that was my desire. You know, I didn't know anything about grant writing or about finding money. I wanted to pass on something so precious mm -hmm. that there was, you couldn't put a price tag on it. You couldn't. So I would say, you know, gee, and, and 
And I couldn't find many black children to come into the company because you know why? Because at that time, number one, they were not in dance schools. They couldn't afford to be in dance schools. So that when I set out an audition for the company, 90% of the people who came to me were white because they were in dance schools and they heard about it where black children or children who were brown didn't hear about it because they didn't know it, but they had no access. Once again, we're looking at well, who's got access to something. So I had to go in, well, go into communities to find children of color, you know, to bring them out to say this. And believe it or not, when I was in New York and went to an audition with my tap shoes, there were black children or black dancers who said to me, why are you carrying around those shoes? And I said, because I'm a tap dancer. I love to tap. We don't, we're not doing that. And they would do pirouettes in front of me to show me that they were doing, you know, more ballet type dance and who, and, and furthermore, it was almost, um, um, I was putting them down, you know, people, black dancers would say to me, we don't shuffle around here. And I knew what that terminology meant to me because that that was they were they were equating shuffling you know to to being less human or less of a dancer than all you know oh no you know oh no we're not doing it oh tap dancing oh it's almost a joke and I, I can remember still going back going back to Newark with tears in my eyes and saying to myself one day they're going to I'll teach them how to do it and that exactly is what happened because they it was put down it was still seen like step and fetch it. It was still one of those art forms and it hasn't gone. And today when AC was talking about when you tell people you're a tap dancer, not only do they tell you that they were one before, they'll start doing it in front of you. All the time. Oh, oh, I oh I can tap dance and they and they grin and they start shuffling, you know, and it, it hurts to the core because it is such a fine tuned art form. Mm. It's so difficult. You really want to do it. You've got to work. It's not something you can jump up and do in the middle. No, but that's what they will do. They will start to smear and trying to get funding for a tap dance company. It's almost like unheard of, you know, or, oh, you're a tap dancer. Oh, that must be fun. Has nothing to do with the lineage, the, the, what it takes to do it, what it can do to bring people together. You know, now today, and people say, oh, boy, what, did, didn't people used to do tap dancing? These are the kinds of, 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 uh, of quotes people give to you or the conversation. Oh, what, whatever happened to tap dancing? Whatever happened to tap? I, you know, I used to, everybody, you know, everybody on my block, there was always somebody who tap danced. But it's, it's not, you know, people say to me, oh, if I say I'm a tap dancer, oh, show me something. Oh, yeah. And I'll say to them, have you ever asked the ballerina to stand here and show you something? I said, well, then, oh, no, that takes, well, that takes years. I said, well, it takes years for tap dancers, too. Mm -hmm. So you won't see it unless, you you know, but those are the kinds of preconceived notions people have about what we do. And so today with Black Lives Matter and all that, it's, it's, Th- things coming home to roost. It really is because it, it's it's not what what we're feeling and seeing right now. It's just been underneath. It's it's, it's been it's been it's it's something just bubbling up to the front, and it's good. It's yeah. good. Even in the tab community, I know that you know the the thoughts. You know, it's not, it's not as AC was saying. It's not the best, but you know what? It has um, pulled back the curtain. It's made people talk. Yeah. It's made us, you know what I was trying to say? It's made us talk to one another. And some of it is painful, but that's okay because you don't get anywhere without some pain. That's right. You know, so, you know, um, I didn't mean to go that far, but I had to let you know, you know, it's rare that we, we as tap dancers get an opportunity to really talk about who we are and where we came from and why we love it and why we do what we do. And the um, uh, New Jersey Tap is not a big company as far as budget-wise because we've never had 
a, a lot of money. We've been blessed with funders and people who love us, but it's so hard to keep going and to and the education. I've had people say, "Oh, you got tap dancers," and they'll invite us, but they don't. They're not care. They don't care about what we need. Our floor, the floor. They'll put us on concrete if they have to. I mean, they, they they could care less about. They don't ask you what do you need. You know, they're not going to do that to a modern or a ballet company. I know this, but they will do it to a tap dance company. They'll say, "Oh well, you know, either you bring your own floor or." Well, can't you use this? It's, 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 it's almost, it's an insult, you know? And I said, no, we, I've get, I have in the early stages of our company, I turned down jobs because they would not help provide us with what we needed. They figured, well, they're just tap dancers. Just tap, and, and there's been concerts where if you say, well, we can carry that. Well, we better bring in another company with you, a ballet or modern company, because I'm not sure that a tap company, yes, we can carry a concert, but these are, so we're still breaking a lot of, there's a lot of barriers that we have, you know, have got to deal with. And I think this whole movement of saying, you know, we matter, you know, see, it's got all those layers to it. And, and, our, and our art form falls right into it. You know, so um, like I said, it's, uh, I understand what I see someone like Asia get emotional. I've cried through what I'm telling you today, but that's okay because I can see Bubba, he goes everywhere with me. And I tell his story as often as I can because it's worth knowing, you know, he, he will always be alive. You know, when I go into a studio you know, today, you know, I, I, see, I see some phenomenal tap dancers. And I often say, well, I'll never be the best in the world. But I'll tell you one thing, you know, one will love it more than me. I will, I will, all, I, he, he'll, he, I call the ghost of gains because he's always around me, you know. And often I'll say, I wonder what Bubba would, would say about this happening today. Or what would he say about that that happening uh, or if I see a dancer I'll say gee I wonder how Bubba and the, but I was really blessed I I was in the presence of people who who danced in in their bare feet who Bubba danced on street corners you know and and he had to take a job like a lot of the guys as a some of them had to wash cars with all that gift they had you, they couldn't get a job, so they had to wash cars. Bubba had to take, was one of those guys from the banks. You know how you put the money together on a Friday evening and he would take it to wherever it had to go and come back. He was always immaculate in his dressing. He was always so proud. And to be someone helping to carry on that legacy with TAP, it means the world to me. So um, no, really, you know, thank you for really I'm fighting. Thank you. I'm, you know, Thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Tony, how, how is the situation that COVID out there, which is, you know, for even established companies, whether they are profit or non-profit or better or not better non-profits, how, how is that for the community? What do you hear? What do you do? This is directed at me? Yeah. Oh, um, well, first, Wait a minute. I, 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 have to, I have to acknowledge these two women, first of all, because the reason I brought them into this Zoom is that we're contemporaries. And these two ladies here are uh, um, survivors of, of, a, of an art form, really. I mean, we've, we've been talking for 25, 30 years because we have similar uh, backgrounds. And, and I do want to just say that I have the same background, the copacetics. I met the copacetics in 1976 in my ho hometown, Fort Collins, Colorado. I met Bubba mm. and Cookie yeah. with Brenda Buffalino, who was replacing, I think, uh, Honey at the time. Because Honey then came through the same uh, weekend, or the same summer, uh, with Bubble and Brown Sugar. And I was crazy enough to call him up and say, we're coming to the show. Can we meet you after the show? And he said, let's have dinner. I mean, that, the point <laughs> is, is that these gentlemen, and, and not forget, not, to not forget the generation of women at the time too, they were generous and they handed us, and I'm gonna now get emotional too. Mm -hmm. 
because that's what we're missing online is the yeah. the personal the, it's great to be able to talk about this virtually but in person you know deb and i we have a monthly lunch and we sit across from each other at a diner right. and we talk <laughs> and complain and confetch about the, the 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 art form and about the community community's great the community's dysfunctional at times um i'm you know here in manhattan in a high-rise uh, reconsidering or, or revisiting, uh, reflecting on my career, on what I've done, what what we've all done, what what can we do moving forward? Um, I think yeah, the three of us are major major uh, survivors, and and we're gonna we're gonna everything's gonna be all right, Asia. <laughs> we are gonna get back into the studio. That's we right. Um, it hasn't been that long. I mean, you know, considering what other people go through and what, right. you know, it's not like a world war or anything, though You're that right. could happen too. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're gonna get back, we're gonna get back and we're gonna, and, and we're gonna survive this. But I think what, what Deborah said also is, this has been an opportunity for me to reflect. And I've been very, very lucky in that I've I've documented everything. Mm. So I have, and I had just deposited our entire archives to the New York Public Library at Lincoln Center, the Jerome Robbins Division, Dance Division. And in doing that, I also kept copies of everything. So I am totally prepared and working on sharing that, that information and that legacy yeah. that I worked hard for and that I believe in. Um, and I want to share, like like uh, Deborah said, that, mm -hmm. that she wants to. Uh, these guys, the copacetics, even the name is a positive um, message about this is a beautiful art form. Mm -hmm. It belongs to everybody. If mm -hmm. you like it, Gregory Hines said the same thing. If you've got a pair of tap shoes, you're in. Mm. Period. The end. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be three years old. You can be an adult student that just does it for fun. Mm. You can be a professional. You can be in, anywhere in the world and become a tap dancer and do with it what you want to. You're not taking it away from anybody. You're, if anything, you're just adding another layer to the amazing art form called tap dance that has been given to us and now we want to share it and we are sharing it and um when i think about younger people today i just i just wish that they would do their research a little bit more yeah. like they would just understand where this stuff came from and it's not like we're not out there telling them and everything is available online now it's like hello you know and so i think that the it, I think it, we're at a crucial time. We're in a very interesting time. There are the haves and the have-nots. There are the privileged and the non-privileged. Absolutely, always, that's society. But if we can make that better and if we can continue the conversation, and thank you for having us to talk to this. Because yeah. here I get to even talk to, to my girlfriends here. I'm, I, I, it, it, it's, it's really deep and it's... Um, Fascinating. I mean, that, the tap dance has, because it's so fascinating that it's used, used for so many things. It's healthy. It, um, it, it it's, it's also um, a way to communicate with people. I mean, I've, I've seen it change so many lives. Mm. It changed my life. Mm. I like Asia and Deborah met the copacetics when I was straight out of high school and I decided to become a tap dancer because up on that stage, they were not only having fun, but they were projecting a positive attitude about, you know, let, let's move forward. Let's move up. Let's move out. Let's, let's, let's uh, share this art form. And, and I think that, that, it's a young, actually it's relatively young in a way. I mean, we're, we're still like, like Deborah and Asia said, there's a lot of misconceptions about tap dance. 
yet today. Yeah. And that's because people just don't know. It's all about education. Mm -hmm. and, and so if we could just continue as a community to support each other, you know, this community has had its moments where all of a sudden society says, oh, that's tap dance. Oh, no, no, now, it's, now this is tap dance. No, what is tap dance? I mean, even, even we're, today when we're talking about what is tap dance, are we talking about what tap dance is in this, or was in the 70s, mm -hmm. or what it is now in Brazil, or what it is in Estonia, for crying out loud? I mean, we've got professional tap dancers in Barcelona and in Berlin and, and at Japan and everywhere. I mean, these people, and they love it just like us, and imagine their struggle because now they're in Japan or Barcelona or whatever trying to raise money for an American art form. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. So yeah. it's all relative and people have to just understand and slow down and listen. Thank you, Asia, because mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of listening too because there's a lot, there's a lot out there right now, a lot of discussion and, and that's a good, good, good thing. Yeah. You know, I think even our generation, we came from a probably I don't know about your parents, but my parents were kind of, yeah, you know, and it was it oh, was yeah. kind of it was kind of the theme of that generation to to maybe not even talk about your own heritage because you're American now, you know. I mean, my 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 grandparents immigrated here from Russia. They were Germans that lived in Russia, but when they came to the states, they they were giving up all of that. They wanted to be American now. So you didn't hear much history. Mm -mm. So, uh, you know, now that we have an opportunity to reflect, I'm feeling good about it. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at stuff that I never even looked at after I filmed it. I didn't even look at it after I filmed it. Now I'm looking at it going, oh my God, look who was in this production. Look what we did. Mm. Look what we put together for one night and maybe 400 people saw it. And the concert that I just did virtually last week, one concert, there's been a thousand people now that have seen that concert mm. virtually. Mm. So there, there, there are definitely pros and cons and I'm all ears and I'm trying to teach myself how to maneuver through the virtual period, yeah. the COVID years. We'll, mm. we'll be talking about this for a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is what is this time of Corona? What does it force you to think about it? What 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 is there something that's changing? Is there something where you say we have to reconsider? Or well, I, I think I think the, for the three of us, it is economic questions. Like how mm -hmm. it's forcing us to okay, how do we operate now if we have no earned yeah. income mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we only rely on funding that's already been cut? Because they don't have any. I mean, I mean, the city, the state, the feds. All nobody right. has any money. I'm expe I'm expecting a real chop, chop yeah. situation. Yeah. Um, so it is survival mode. A lot yeah. of it is about surviving. But but I think we're also service organizations. We're nonprofits, so our job is to inspire people. Also. Yeah. So how do we come up with? the next program that's gonna pull yeah. people in and, and, and right. how do we share this information? You know, Zoom is not a great platform for teaching, that's for sure, no. because no. of the delay and everything, but it, it kind of does work and it, and it offers a different opportunity now where, where we're actually, t I, I'm, ta I'm, I'm teaching now uh, virtually and I'm talking to the students a lot more, not because I know I can't tap as much, but for some reason I, it's necessary in this, in this the, the feeling, the vibe of the world right now is we need to communicate a little bit more. We need to yeah. ma make amends maybe or, or create new um, dialogue and new, new bridges with. Yeah. With the, you know, you hit on something, you hit on something, Tony, when you said 
you know, going back and looking at a video that, or a show that you hadn't seen since you filmed it. I mean, I'm, I'm in the, I do the same thing. And, and Deborah, you probably do too. Mm -hmm. How often do you go back? We used to have cast parties back in the day uh -huh. where you watch yeah. the videotape, but, um, you know, tapestry through soul to soul festival, cause it actually soul to soul has been around, uh, 28 year 28 years but it used to be called the austin tap jam but we started a faculty conservatory i don't know tony if you were involved in some of the earlier ones but it was just the remember. faculty getting together yeah yeah it used to be yeah, a week it used to be a week long and it would be at the very early ones were focused around an artist so there's like a week-long conservatory around fayard and so it's Fayard in the room with everybody talking and then we were learning from him and the oral histories around all that stuff. I haven't gone back to look at that stuff. Oh, yeah. And I think, you know, in connecting to the people that were involved, because, you know, obviously it would be something that, that uh, we would all agree need to be out there. Those things need to be seen, that history, the fact that something so special in so many um, arenas, only 400 people saw it or only whatever. And it's all of that. There's a lot of stuff we can share without spending money, mm -hmm. you know, and it helps educate. Well, you know? and I think as long as you're not like, you know, raising a, uh, money for it. Right, I mean, exactly. I, I basically, I'm putting things out there now, you know, if you want to donate, then we'll just consider a, a donation. Right. Like, you want to give us $5 exactly. or whatever, but you don't have to. Exactly. Like, no, yeah, that, that's and, the way to go. Well, you know, you you both of you are right because what I've been doing, I have you know in '94 when the company started, we have all these VHS tapes. I mean, I have not very. They were all on VHS. Some really precious, precious um, uh, information and performances, and people have never. Some people have never seen them, or they'll say, "Well, remember when we did this or did that?" Even for me, I've been. One thing that is being sheltered in, I've had a chance to clean out, just to, you know, do almost like a purging of what, what's, what's here, what do I remember? And I, I think that um, I've been sending things out now to be digitized so yeah. that we can take, you know, I have, like I said, there are dancers like even Jason Janis, who was of with course. Me. I've got him when he's 16 years old. Oh. You, you know, see. and that kind of stuff needs to be seen. I mean, it's archival, but it shows the roots. You know, exactly. I've got, you know, dancers, uh, Maurice Chestnut, when he was on uh, uh, Sally Jesse Raphael's show at, at 10 <laughs> years old. But Love these it. are things that if I, you know, I could put them online. And, and Tony gave me a great idea. He does this little Tony TV and, and I, yeah. let people see, let people see. You know, because a lot of of our of people who see us today think of us as today. They don't think that there was a history. Oh, right. That, you know that we've right. come a long way. You know, and if they need to see, and and the people who are their teachers now, they have a history with us. So they need to see that stuff. That you know, it's been, you know, it's it's in boxes and places, and I'm bringing them out now. I said I've got to get this out. Yeah. Um, and, and Tony's helped me to, to think about, you know, archiving stuff is a exactly. huge so job, huge, huge job. So but, so but, you, but one of the things, and I have to say, even with this program, um, arc, oral histories are so important. Uh, you know, when, um, when I got an invitation this year to do an oral history for the uh, Library of Performing Arts in New York. Of course, COVID came in and stopped that and we didn't get back to it yet. We will, I'm sure next year. But I'm aware yeah. that that some things only you can tell, you right. know, if your story, only you can tell it. And the oral history is so valuable for those kinds of things because yes. I thought, oh gee, you know, and, and but because of that, I started to look at my past and look at and connect all these dots. You know how I got from here to there. And some days, it, it amazes me that that I did X, Y, and Z. You know, what I'm saying, oh, I. But you know, of course, part of it was youth. I was fearless. I, mean, I would just go and get whatever I needed today. I'd think more about it, you know, but when you're younger, you don't always think. And, so, and thank God you don't, because sometimes if you thought about it enough, you might not have done it. So, you know, but get, like you say, getting that stuff out, 
And uh, because those elders talked to, we were in the room with right. them. Right. And that's different from just reading it in a book or seeing it on a YouTube. Right. If you've been in the room with these people. That's so, you know, that uh, the, those are your roots. So young people today haven't had that opportunity. They need to be in the room with more of us to, to know what it was, what it's all about so they can hear. Because in, in oral histories, you get things you don't get in any other place. So that's why it's so valuable. But um, yeah. listening, but ACS has something from the very beginning. I too am going through, some days I just, I'm overwhelmed. I just have to listen for where people are coming from, what, wh where the pain is coming from and how deep the pain is and how many layers, you know, of what we're going through. And it's good that we're going through it because, because yeah. you don't get anywhere. You don't, you know, it's like anything. You got to go through painful times to get to the other side. But we can do this if you're willing to listen. You got to hear, you know. Yeah. So there are day, you know, there. I have had days when I'm just so overwhelmed by all of this. I'll just do nothing. I just sit and think, you know, and reflect. But that's good, too, because sometimes we need to stop. Deborah, how is how yeah. is it for your tap dance ensemble at the moment? How is it looking? Do you get support? Will that survive? How is your well? Also, in the movement, everybody says yes. Black Lives well, 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 right now, now, right what now, you know, we have um, we have uh, major, basically our support has come in the, in the past through funders, you know, like foundation yeah. support and that that kind of thing. And of course, we have a board and advise uh, a board and advisors who listen to what we're going through. But primarily, it's um, um, our fans, the people who love us, who love to who love what we do. That's where the support is is coming from. We do have, like I said, our funders, and including uh, our arts council and uh, foundation support comes through for us. But they are, you know, it's. Um, it's not a lot. We have to really, you know, depend on we depend on the public. That's really what we what we're we're, we're all about. Public so, for tickets, you mean? Or? You know, and we don't we don't have a uh, what I call a calendar of events like some companies have a calendar of events that are coming for because it goes back to promoting the art form into to having shows of that nature. If we don't do it ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, um, if we don't produce programs ourselves very few people are going to come to us about it because like i said once again it's tap dancing and 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 unless you have uh someone who really uh, promotes promoters who really appreciate what you do you know you're not going to have uh a, we, sh we should have many more concert performances or just outlets to show you know we have some some tremendous talent in this organization but getting it out there is very, very difficult. Most yeah. of them are teaching, you know, teaching first. But even that, you know, they, that's difficult these days because you either record your teaching or you do it on Zoom. Um, you know, it's um, not easy. It's, you know, it's not easy. And we do have, um, you know, we apply for some of the, for the like, like the payroll protection plan. You know, we have, you know, within our organization, everyone is supportive, but we've got to get, you know, we need a lot more, a lot more. So we, I've learned though that that our that the general public, those people that know who we are and know our artists, they are very, very generous. You know, I mean, they give, you know, when you don't expect them to give, and um, that's why some of our programs. I know during this time we we've, we've had to just to keep us out there, you know, we've done some of some programs like our master classes for very little fees because we also know that people, you know, are out of work. They, and, they and, really and, yeah. and the arts is, you know, unfortunately the arts um, at this stage of the game is, is on the shelf because people are looking at food, shelter, clothing. They can't, you know, uh, uh, going to a concert uh, are taking a dance class is not a high priority, and you can understand that because they're trying to survive. So um, a lot of what we have, we we've given away almost because we want uh, our fan base, in particular, to know that we are with you. 
you know, um, like Tony said, if you have a donation you want to make, we appreciate that. But um, we're trying to ride it. it we're, we're, you know, it's it's truly, as my mom would say, hand to mouth. We're just trying to yeah. ride to ride yeah. this wave because we don't we, we we don't know. You know, it's very hard to see the future yeah. right now. It really is. It Gotta really stay is. present. Mm -hmm. How is it in Austin? Is are you supported and? Uh, we are supported by the city of Austin, and um, as of maybe four weeks ago, they announced that we were going to get um, a minimum of a 58% cut in city funding because it's based in hotel motel taxes. Uh, the, the council did decide to um, fund 100% our black uh, artists and organizations, which I think was a wonderful move at the time because there's there were people that thought it should be, you know, slow, you figured out it, we were, the whole city was going through an equity uh, reevaluation. So uh, in many ways, that's such a positive move for Austin, but Austin in general being was called the music capital of the world. And it was living that uh, reputation has lost probably hundreds of live music venues by now. Um, and, um, the theaters, not the, the biggest ones, you know, they may have their endowments. Um, the smaller ones are struggling, trying to find creative ways to stay alive. The um, you know, what's that? The root mechanicals, right? The root the, exactly. Rude Max, right. Rude mechanicals, ground Great. floor theater, the vortex. Um, there's so many, there's very creative people here and we're talking to each other. Uh, we're going to try to host something very soon about just getting, you know, some ideas together. Collaboration is mm. what we're talking about. Uh, but again, Austin public will not go inside. And I do agree with you guys. I, 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 it's hard for me. My gut knows that we'll live through this. My heart just hurts right now. Yeah, so exactly. that's where I'm living in. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, just like doing something, you know, the, the cars in the circle in the parking lot, like a, like a, 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 a drive-in theater, then you start looking at who's going to let you do that on the property and liability things yeah, and blah, yeah. blah, blah. There's yeah. so yeah. many things to think yeah. about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back to what I said earlier about, you know, trying to do something online, it's getting into creativity process of a filmmaker, not that we don't have connections to them, but do we have a budget to support something above and beyond what we are doing? Um, I am, and we are um, planning on, on uh, supporting our company that has shrunk from eight professional dancers to five mm -hmm. for budgetary reasons over budget cuts that were taken a couple of years ago citywide. Um, but it's, it's, it's hard to know where Austin's gonna come out of this. Um, we're a very liberal city, very supportive um, of each other, but some of our beloved restaurants and iconic places are closing daily. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to know. And, and I, I know we're not the only city going through that. And it's really hard to know what's going to happen. I wish we all, you know, I'll say a political statement, but I wish we all would have had a, a Cuomo in our, in our court, you know, and trying to manage the COVID-19 crisis months ago, mm. because, you know, some of the states we're in did not do the same thing. And mm. Um, mm. it's yeah, just, it's not, like, you discussion. know, we've been, we've been blessed as well. Um, we're one of seven organizations here in Austin that was blessed with an NEA CARES grant. Um, and I feel so blessed that that happened. Um, and there were so many deserving all everybody that applied I wish could have have gotten that but it you know I look budget wise it doesn't make up for the 58% cut that's going to happen with the city so it's like even trying to get back to a minimum without earned income well is, and you have sorry for interrupting but no, no, no. similar to me you you have a space that you have to yes keep yes paying somehow. rent on an empty space so so yeah so you have to like re rejig all of that too like yeah. what, what do you do with that space i know deborah you rent space yeah well yeah and that we're not doing that right now only because of naturally of the risks that are involved as yeah, far as but you, know, you have a and, lease and you want to keep exactly. things going and, and i have to say too I, um 
we have survived with some out of this world in kind support, you know, people yeah. who just love the company. I don't know where we would be without some of the people that, I mean, they're, and they're not just, um, you know, throwing at you, making do. These are professional people, you know, That's who right. know what they're doing, who have been willing because they know, you know, that the company, the heart of the company, they know that we're real, that we're not, that we're yeah. trying to do, trying to serve exactly. the community. So, you know, things that they do, I mean, I've, everything from costumes, costumes to, to you know, uh, to marketing, you know, we don't have a big budget. We're just not in that, in that uh, you know, doing that. But right. and even the funders, you know, at least um, with the Arts Council, they will send, me, send us um, emails about uh, opportunities in the field. You know, so at least everyone knows everyone is going through a very difficult time. So it's not like they've forgotten about you, but but the um, the money is just is the need is so great. The need, the need is, is so, so great. great, and and like I said, and I I really do understand. You know that uh, people are trying to survive. Like even with the classes, I worry about the fact that everybody doesn't have a computer. Uh, you no. know, I mean, we're talking about or internet. Right, it's disproportionate. I mean, there's some people yeah, who got same, same. everything. Yeah, we got people who, you know, if, one of the things that I've done, believe it or not, is I get on the phone and call people, an old-fashioned thing. Just say how you doing. We haven't yeah. forgotten about you because everybody's not connected. You know, it's you know, and um, you know, people say, well, we'll have a Zoom class. Well. First of all, it's difficult to do a Zoom class. I don't care what anyone says with tap dancing because you got audio problems, you oh, got all hard. kind of things that interfere, you know, and scheduling. So you you know, um, every child, if there's one computer in the house, maybe mom or dad is working from home, they can't be on there to do a tap class, you know, or right. so you got you gotta take into consideration all the everything that's a the domino effect. What's affecting this person the next right. time? I call people up you know, say, and I tell my artists, don't disconnect because this is a time when you can become very, very um, depressed mm -hmm. and and not knowing. I mean, in a lot of of uh, uh, a lot of our uh, youth company, there these are kids who are in school or would like to be in school, so they're at home now. They they're not sure what's going to happen, so we have to stay in touch with them. But the bottom line is that. I tell them, don't disconnect. Call one another. Um, let let people know how you even are feeling, you know, because you, and you can't get that through an email. No. Or, you know, you got to physically, you no. know, what we're missing is the human spirit in touch. And when they hear yeah. your voice and you just say, I'm just calling to say, I'm thinking about, you, that goes a long way. You yeah, know, it so does. Those are, and I tell you something else I've, I've discovered lately. Um, is um, looking at how else we're connected. Um, one of one of my uh, dancers um, likes uh, had just started to do some planting. Up, uh, uh, is doing some repotting. Well, I have I love plants, and I have a room here in the house that's like botanical gardens. So when I found out how much he loved planting, I took a little video with my phone and showed him all my plants and the names uh -huh. of them and everything. So we can connect on other, we have other things in common. Sometimes, you know, you, if you say, you know, let's try, let's talk about this. It gets you out of a funk where you're trying exactly. to do just this, including cooking. A lot of us yeah. are cooking now more than we've ever cooked before. We've been sharing recipes and, yep. you know, things. Yep. But it's, it's the human element that we, that, that's the only thing that will bring us out of, yeah. you know, this, um, this tendency to become depressed and saddened, you know, about what's going on. But, um, but we, it's, we have to face it. There are days, you know, when it's, um, I'm not sure. Oh, there are days when we just want to quit. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Let's yep. just be real. We just yeah. want to quit. And we just yeah. can't. No, that's yep. true, Tony. Mm hmm. Just say, oh, forget it. You know, it's too hard. It's too, and it is. There are days. That, that, that's what we have in our little lunches. We talk about that. There. How are you surviving? How are you, you know? <laughs> but it's so good to have an uh, opportunity to share, you know? Yeah. So uh, w what a uh, privilege I feel it always is to tell, some, so for someone to even want to know how you're doing. Right. You know, some people don't even care, 
you right. know, so to for you know for this you know to for to have this opportunity when Tony called me, just I said, oh, I would love to share. Yeah, you know, because um, you we need we need to be connected. Otherwise, you know, you go downhill fast. Yeah, yeah it's, really do. It's rough. You know, it's, like, it's a really really hard time uh, for everybody, but especially for the one who are not in the center of the disenfranchised already over okay. centuries of a long time. Mm -hmm. We had Karina Switch, who's a Latinx uh, uh, writer and translator, and she said, our theaters are gonna close. They are small ones anyway, they barely are doing it. Mm -hmm. She thinks it's gonna be an extinction of what keeps a variety, diversity, of what makes America, America. The languages you hear on the street, the songs and the movements, mm -hmm. it shouldn't happen. It should be at the center and it's a- Well, you know, people yeah. take, not to cut you off, but people take the arts, I think sometimes for granted. Yeah. Because, you know, when you have to stay home, all of a sudden, you know, if you think about your life, you know, what enriches you? What enriches your life? Well, maybe it's a good book that you've read. It's a movie. It's a concert. It's um, something, you know, that, and we just take it for granted, you know, that, oh, you know, I'll just go to, I'll go to the movies this weekend. Or I do, when all of that gets shut down yeah. completely, you know, it, it, all of a sudden people realize, and you hear people talk about sports a lot, you know, how important sports are. Well, you know, artists, you know, you, when Broadway is shut down, you you talk about who gets affected. Well, you've got the ushers. You've got restaurants who are nearby that are only maybe there because of they're in, say, a certain area in New York. You've got concessions. You've got souvenirs. No. You've got there are people working there. When that's shut down, oh. it's like with sports. They talk about, oh, the parking. Where are they going to park for the game, you know, and selling things? Well, the arts have the same kinds of problems and no one is thinking about it because they think, oh, gee, it's fun. You know, they're artists, they're dancers, they're singers. This, this, this is a, it's a career. It's something that, you know, we have to survive too. And yes, uh, yeah. the arts will have a significant impact economically, oh, but also, yes. but yeah. even beyond that, you know, art is a reward for a great society of a, a city that works and you enjoy it. good sports. And I like sports, yeah. but someone loses yeah. it, wins, but yeah. theater yeah. and the arts, you see things from different sides. You see what yeah. the opposites, what the contradictions we all live in, that there's truths. You know, there's a Michael Train, a great playwright said, a great play is uh, when every character is right, what he or she says, you know, when, and the same is, and if you look at tap, um, if you look at George Nirenberg's uh, great documentaries uh, on taps, yeah. no maps on my tap. No maps on my taps. Exactly. If you want to know what a great art form that is, you know, the mm -hmm. subtlety, the beauty, also the way of, you know, using your feet, the only thing you had when you went from house to house, and, uh, and the, the movement that then was so stolen in a way by uh, Hollywood, and then the mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. left it in a way and slowly came back, perhaps a bit with Jackson and his White Sox, Michael Jackson, but um, but the subtlety of it, and you know, if you see, I forget the artist. I once saw a video of me was dancing on steel and sand, uh, mm. tap dancer. You know, it was you know, it was like a Beckett play. You know, it was like the mm. highest form of an artistic. Um, I felt you know uh, uttering or rendering or a mm -hmm. comment on existence of life and tap is a, such a brilliant and beautiful form and also the contemporary new one is a hybrid has connected has found hybrid forms that are no longer the traditional ones or the oh, ones yeah. we kind of have in our minds what people do in America companies from Argentina and Japan and Americans and what they come up with um, is uh, stunning and, mm -hmm. and it has to be and should be supported and it is it is not um, so what do you what, what is your what is your uh, outlook do you think that um, uh, it will throw you back a decade or do you think perhaps people will see no tap is something that's alive we can do it we can study we can, it will come out stronger I think it's going to be self-preservation of the artists that are in it right now, the artists and the teachers and those that are connected to our past that are going to keep it alive. It will not come outside of our own community. I don't believe. I don't think the average American or the average person's going to go, oh, now I'm interested in tap dance. No, no it's got to no. be, it's got to come from our family and then directed to communicate outside that circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's definitely we have to do the work. Yeah, we have to do the work. Exactly. It's not yeah. going to it, you know, it because yeah. like I said, we're 26 years old and when I started, you know, um I was fighting to give it respect and to and I wanted to be And respected. you're still doing. It. And I'm uh-huh. exactly and I'm still fighting to give it respect and a and it's and its place, you know, I mean, um you know, it, it gets lumped into folk dance and things. Right. It, it's it does other and, and okay. other, it'll be you know on on some grants on some forms there'll be um, ballet, there'll be modern, um, ethnic, ethnic, a, ethnic, and and other or folk. Right. You know where is tap? I mean, you know, right. I said myself, why doesn't it, it's a category? Why did, yeah. it needs to pull out of that? You know, and I don't think it's just because I love it. I, I think I know I'm right. You know, no, the, you are the, right. The, the you are thing, right, and it, and I. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I think you are right. And I think that so much of our grant processes and applications all tie back to academia. Uh And academia has always been set in a Eurocentric mentality. Mm -hmm. And I'll guarantee you, unless that system changes, it's going to stay the same. Mm -hmm. And there will be people that will try to preserve the ballet world. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. There will be. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But until that system and that 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 system changes and the educational system changes in colleges and universities as to what is represented in um, and not only tap dance, but jazz dance. And uh-huh. I mean, just dance beyond ballet and what used to be called modern. I mean, mm-hmm. there are colleges that that still teach what is what's called modern. Now it's contemporary, which is temporary. Everything that's not, yeah, the kitchen mm-hmm. sink. But, you know, there's people that don't realize that, that hip-hop culture and jazz culture and tap culture and all of that is from the same, it's the same roots. It's the right. same exactly mm-hmm. the same tree. Mm-hmm. And until, until that changes, then the grant program and the applications won't change. But back to the original question, the change will happen inside our community. It yes. will not be something, unless something radical changes in government, it's mm-hmm. not going to come from outside of us. No, absolutely not. No. And it's going to be a long haul like it yeah. has been. It's yeah. in, in the same way that Black Lives Matters. It's right. gonna, we're going to have to do a lot of work yeah. that we probably won't even see the benefits of. Sure in Mm -hmm. our generation it Mm -hmm. will be for the future and that's okay but that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to Mm -hmm. to um wrap your brain around some of this and and put in the energy it is Um, and and i mean it's it's hopeful in knowing that you know before john lewis passed and i can't believe in the passing happening yes on friday but Mm -hmm. um you know, he had mentioned and people have talked about that what's going on has gone on now is bigger than what happened in the 60s. Mm, mm-hmm. So it's getting there's more the diversity is bigger. The b- groups are bigger. There's more stuff and people are ang- I won't say angrier because how could you not? Obviously, in the 60s, there was horrible stuff that was just as much anger, but the numbers are bigger. Is it a coincidence we were in COVID-19? So thousands if not millions of people could gather in protest a protest of inequality and black lives matter that wouldn't have happened if everybody that would not have happened so everything i'm a big believer in rhythm and energy and love and negative energy begets negative energy and positive you know it comes back to you and this is a big karmic event there's just a lot of darkness i don't mean to get all spiritual that's all right but it's like you said you're correct the bc one thing about COVID nineteen, with the with the protests and all that, people were not were not working. Right. So they could get out and march. Right. Okay, they could you know, which is a difference from you know the normal kind of protest that you know. Okay, some people over here got together, you know, but exactly. this was this was it's a global pan, it's a pandemic. Exactly. So you got people. Everybody's looking at the same thing. You right. Know? So you can't. It was great, and it was wonderful. You can't hide. You know. And we can't you, stop. And, and it just has, and it, it and you can't stop. But I do, because it's bigger, because more people are involved. Hopefully, you know, change is going to happen in November for the for the U.S. government. 
that, you know, action will be taken. There were big actions taken in 63 and 65 and 68. Oh, yes, it were. can happen in our lifetime as far as, as far as law changes, mm. as far as, you know, you know, many things that need to be adjusted because it's, we're, we're, it's the laws and the way that they're, you know, can get around law and help people. I mean, there's so many things. Mm. Yeah. Um, we, we, that, we're, we're learning so much yeah. more. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you, Go back to the 70s, you didn't find out how things played out or what was going on for 20 years. Exactly. Now, all of a sudden, you, then you heard about uh, the Vietnam War and, and, and what was all the politics that played into that and all the yep. presidents that decided for whatever reason to continue that war or not. Right. And, but now, you know, everything is, I mean, we're finding out about things before they happen, I mean, we're exactly, or we're or we're hearing all kinds of opinions about everything, right? Like daily in the in the minute, and and some of it's right, and some of it's wrong, and some of it's important, some of it's uh, you know like bullshit, right? But, so it's confusing, but at least I think we have the capacity, and there's there's. The possibility of, of moving a little bit quicker now. Yeah. Hope, yeah, hope. because communication is quicker. quicker. I mean, it makes and logical sense. You can just sense. get, you know, the leadership issue yes. together. Then. Yes. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, I think it is a big moment of change. And I really, really hope that also tap dance will be part of it and that it will be catch some of the wind um, of the change. Like jazz had also a hard time. I think it was jazz at Lincoln Center that fundamentally mm -hmm. also changed. Um, and then the relation into it. And I, I do hope that uh, something like this um, um, also will happen. Uh, we're coming towards the end of the session. Is there something, for me as a short statement, what do you say to a young artist, a young tap artist, um, uh, um, if they say, should I take a class, should I not take a class, or um, how, should I, well, how should I use this time now if all of you could get a short advice from your experience, what, what should people do? Well, I really want them to, to, if it's a young tap artist, I want them to look at its history. I, yes. want them to, I want them to dig deep. I really do. And they have time to do it now so that they know, you know, it didn't start yesterday. It didn't start yep. 10 years ago. That to look at the history, become knowledgeable, because that's where your power is, you know, to understand, understand the art form and, you know, and not just look at it as, oh, isn't that fun to do? Yes, it is. And it is wonderful. It makes you feel fantastic. But know your history. Yeah. I had to do that myself. And, you know, as an adult, I had to go back because so much of the history is not in the books and it was not, no. it, it wasn't, it wasn't made available to me. I had to do my own search. Yep. So that's what any, I would tell any young artist, know where, I'm never against going forward. I mean, all of us, you know, the world has changed and, and we need new minds and new, it's like trying to find this vaccine. Somebody's going to come up with that. We have to yeah. keep looking, but you got to know where you came from to go forward exactly. so that you don't make some of those, you know, so you, you, so you appreciate it, you right. know, and, yep. uh, because yeah. I, I, like people ask me all the time, they say, well, Deborah, what do you think about these young people? I think they're wonderful because without young people wanting to do this, it's going to die on a vine anyway. So you've got to make sure that yeah. not only do you let them know you appreciate and accept them, but make them understand where it came from. Yeah. And, and, and that gives them more power as they go yeah. forward. Yeah. Just know your history. Yep. It is. Know your history. And I'm always, you know, our steps are history and you can find that out in doing your education, but to learn steps, especially from a screen by rote, copying a teacher is not what tap dance is about. No. Right. I mean, it can be about teaching a tool, just like tap dance is a, it, tap dance is a language mm -hmm. and you can learn a language that's a direct, you know, is a direct link to your mentor, your teachers, collection okay. of teachers, share what you know, share the oral history, to pick up those things, but the history is what's going to make, just like the English language, you can, you can memorize, I've said this before, you can memorize a dictionary, but if you don't know your history and you don't have anything to say, what is it worth? The steps right. aren't worth anything unless you know where it, what you're doing with what you want to say, what's your, 
representing in history or what you're trying to communicate. And I would only I would only add to that that do the work and yeah. and at the artistic work. If you really want to dance, then go into a studio yeah. and dance. Yeah, true. You don't need somebody else to tell you what to do. I mean, yeah, do your history and get inspired, but go in there and figure something out for yourself. Yeah. Take care Make of yourself. Make it up. Make it yeah. up. Some of our best tap dancers didn't go to school. They have their own style that they created in their back, you know, their back porch or, or in a studio on their own because they just wanted to make music. So, well, Tony, it's like I said, Tony, I hate to cut you off. It's like I said, I never had a mirror. A yeah, I didn't, you know, yeah. I wasn't, I didn't, like, like today, you know, some kids, all they can dance is in front of a mirror. But, you know, if you learn how to dance like I did almost in a dark room, you know, by myself, that's, right. that's why audience doesn't, doesn't scare me because I can look, I'm looking out. I'm not looking at me, you know. Right. So, so, so just, forget the exactly. syllabus, the mirror, right. yeah. the, the copying of the steps. Yeah, just yeah. go in and, and dance. Feel yeah. the rhythm. Have Enjoy fun. it. That's right. Enjoy That's right. it. You're all right. Feel exactly. your body. Feel the rhythm great, in your body. Great, great, yeah. great advice. Know your history. Be present. And do find your own steps. You know? yeah. Don't, uh, find your own soul. Do don't make karaoke, do your own stuff. And that's mm -hmm. so important. I think that was a great update and really thank you for, um, for, for sharing, you know, this is a significant uh, art form. And I know, I think the great David Goddard at the Riverside Studios at the time, he was also one who said, these are great artists, they should come to Europe. He got them and then Nuremberg got them on the film and now you are the next generation. And then, and you're educating the next one. So this is a important work, um, what you do. And mm -hmm. uh, and um, and yes, this is your experience of this time. And I'm so sorry, you know, it's so tough and it's so hard and that is really endangering in an existential way, not only lives, which we are, but also your institutions and your work. So don't quit, mm -hmm. um, stay, stay with it. On the Seagull Center talk, we will go around the world and we will have uh, tomorrow a Carl Hancock Rax, a fantastic and brilliant mind, a New York theater artist, writer, producer, a poet, um, and uh, he is a, a great mind and he will share uh, what's on, what he's thinking about. Uh, we will have on Wednesday from one of the great theaters in France, uh, Philippe Cunet, uh, I hope I say it right, uh, uh, from the Théâtre des Amandiers, out in Nanterre, uh, is one of the big theaters, and we hear from him uh, what uh, he, he uh, is uh, planning, how he's reacting there. Betty Chamier will uh, talk to us uh, from San Francisco. She's from the Arab American theater community, and we're going to hear from her also how that feels like. She's based in New York and in San Francisco and goes back and forth. And then the Adelheid Rosen from the Netherlands and Amsterdam, a great theater maker, an artist, community organizer, and uh, socially engaged artist. Uh, we'll talk with Melanie Joseph here from uh, the Great Foundry Theater about what is it, what we need to do in theater, how can we react, how can we do meaningful work that perhaps gets also the audience awards, the ones, uh, uh, Deborah, you got, and that is important. And I really, if any funders are out there, you support TAP, I think it's a, a significant form. It needs also room to breathe, to experiment, to be supported, and uh, something great, you know, might come out. And what you have now is your body, you have a space. So perhaps if you're interested in TAP yourself, uh, this is a moment you can do it if you have if we all in your own our own rooms in a for a year long there's something you we all can discover thanks for HowlRound for hosting us um tony thanks for calling your colleagues for us and bringing um, uh, both of them in this is a great contribution and uh, thanks to the Siegel team and i hope thank you be able thank to you add. frank for having us and and being concerned and and uh, yeah, oh, good really. seeing you ladies thank you. Uh, okay yeah, so yeah, thank you all bye bye <laughs> Goodbye. Good Thank you. Audience, uh, stay safe, uh, wear a mask, and uh, stay tuned. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 I love it. <laughs> that was great. That I'm was great. You. That yeah. was wonderful. I'm glad we, we had this to, chance. We, we get to continue. I know. This <laughs> I know. Is cool. I know. I'm glad. To, I'm glad. And they're recording. Here. They're still recording. I love it, Deborah. I oh. miss you. Oh, I listen. You. I, I'm telling you, it's it's so good. This is it's the upside. At least I see your face. You know, right. and, I know. And, can see, and you know, I, you know, I'm always amazed at how emotional this makes me. I usually, yeah. I, you know, how you think you're on top of something, you know, and you can 
express yourself and but but it's like yesterday you know it brings back so much so many memories you know and and i can still see him and and hear his the things that his little jokes he was always joking about you know it's a little, and, and taking me to showman's and you know oh things, my gosh yeah oh, the, thing, you know, the thing is is that we're confronted at the moment with all these questions you know yeah, yeah. and and we and we tend to like turn to and try to figure out or or or, or we must validate our situations yeah sometimes. that's the big one right there that's the big that's the big question and then and then but 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 but, but okay that's fine that's sure. that's fine but um we know we know what we're doing we've yeah. been doing this a long time yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry, nobody's going to take this away from me. No. Good. No, absolutely. You've done beautiful work, Tony, and you've well, so We all have. We all, it's been a community. It has been a community. It has been a community. Yeah. yeah. You know, yes. How many times? It wouldn't I, be this I, far. I mean, it, you know, when you think back, with people, even when they branch off, but where did they start? They came yeah. to the festivals and people let you brought them in and people, yeah. you know what I'm yeah. saying? And whether you get credit for that or not, it doesn't it, matter. It doesn't matter. Exactly. People, bad people, there are bad seeds and good seeds and it's yeah. always going to be it doesn't bad. Matter. Way. And this sometimes that's matter. probably a good thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes you got to know how wonderful good. certain people are. Thank you very much. You too. <laughs> okay. So the next time you guys go to lunch, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll zoom you in. You need to in. FaceTime me or something. Oh, we we'll have to do that. Jealous. We love our lunches. I mean, we just, so, oh, that's so I good. So I don't know what I would do without them because many times I'm just, you know, you get overwhelmed and fed up, you know, and then you sit down and when you start to talk, you say, yeah, I'm doing that too. You know, this right. is, you know, I mean, it, it validates what we're trying to do. You know what I mean? It does. I mean, you Tony and I are able. Yeah. And that, what like what you said, talk. listening, you got to listen to each other. Yes. You know? Yes. When Tony and I talked last week or whenever, a couple of times, it's like, it is, it's like you can breathe, it, you can just let go. Yeah. Like you feel like you're in a safe place to bitch and right. vent. That's and right. You know each other's experiences and then mm -hmm. you can grow and share and communicate. Sure. Exactly. <sighs> You know, and, it, and you know, you Hi do. All. You Thank you talk. so much for joining us today. I'm afraid I do have to end the live stream. For some <laughs> hey, well, listen, that part was, was <laughs> the really good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody be well. Stay well. Okay. Love, Love you guys. Love you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>